Hey, how's it going, you fiends? I'm Demi Bobemi. And I'm dead inside. And welcome back to another eldest. Ooh. Ooh, what? Eldest. Not Aragon. <laughs> yeah. Last time on Eldest. Bob Eldest. I was going to say that. We're like the same person. I can just read your mind. Um, yep. Last time, the committee said, hey, Aragon, we need to pick a new leader. And Aragon said, it's going to be me. And then they didn't say that. But so he said, OK, like, what's the dealio? And they said, we wanted to be Nazawada, but you have to swear fealty to us. And he said, uh, sure. And then Nazawada said, I'm a boss ass bitch. And then Arya said, what the fuck did you just do, you stupid idiot little boy? And Aragon said, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not what you think. Now she's happy. And she's like, oh, you're right. It isn't what I thought. I'm just overreacting. Yeah, she was. I mean, you know what I'm saying, though. Women, right? But that just shows, like, her expectations of Aragon. I mean... What? No, nothing. Oh. This is looking. Um, Could probably go this way a little bit. Can you blame her, though? Thanks, cameraman. <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> can't fault her. Can't blame her. Can't do anything to her. <laughs> <laughs> Number 15, anime of titties. <laughs> Let's go before my face turns as red as the wall behind us. I am excited to start this chapter because before I always skip this. And so this part of the story I'm the least familiar with. I probably haven't read the story of Roran in like, I don't know, a decade. I just always skip it. Oh, okay. Let's get to getting. Chapter four. <laughs> Roughly. Roran. Roran trudged up the hill. I like how the chapter name is Roran and the first word in the chapter is Roran. He should have just been like, he trudged up the hill. Who? Fucking Roran! <laughs> Roran should have said he trudged up the hill? Yeah. He should have just ex did exposition for himself at to himself and said he trudged up the hill. Oh. He stopped and squinted <laughs> at the sun through his shaggy hair. Five hours till sunset. I won't be able to stay long. With a sigh, he continued along the row of elm trees, each of which stood in a pool of uncut grass. This was his first visit to the farm since he, Horst, and six other men from Carvajal had removed everything worth salvaging from the destroyed house and burned barn. It had been nearly five months before he could consider returning. Once on the hilltop, Roran halted and crossed his arms. Before him lay the remains of his childhood home. A corner of the house still stood, crumbling and charred, but the rest had been flattened and was already covered with grass and weeds. Nothing could be seen of the barn. The few acres they had managed to cultivate each year were now filled with dandelions, wild mustard, and more grass. Here and there, stray beets or turnips had survived, but that was all. It's because beets. 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 <laughs> the other day we were talking about beets for some reason and I was yeah. trying to say the battle star or bears, bears beets, beets battle Battlestar star galactic Galactica. I was trying to say that but I started it off with beets <laughs> but I knew the second word was beets <laughs> and so I just kept saying beets I was like beets 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 <laughs> just beyond the farm a thick belt of trees obscured the Anora River Roran clenched a fist, jaw muscles nodding painfully as he fought back a combination of rage and grief. He stayed rooted at the spot for many long minutes, trembling whenever an unpleasant memory rushed through him. This place had been his entire life, and more. It had been his past, and his future. His father, Gero, once said, The land is a special thing. Care for it, and it'll care for you. Not many things will do that. Roran had intended to do exactly that up until the moment his world was ruptured by a quiet message from Baldor. With a groan, he spun away and stalked back toward the road. Sounds like he's bitter. Ooh. 
drama. Ooh, spill that tea. <laughs> <clears throat> the shock of that moment still resonated within him. Having everyone he loved torn away in an instant was a soul-changing event from which he would never recover. It had seeped into every aspect of his behavior and outlook. It also forced Roran to think more than ever before, which was something he never did before. He never really thought about anything. It was as if bands had been cinched around his mind and those bands had snapped, allowing him to ponder ideas that were previously unimaginable, such as the fact that he might not become a farmer, or that Justice, the greatest standby in songs and legends, had little hold in reality. At times, he's thought... I was going to say, like, justice in those stories never came about by accident. Someone went out and sought that justice. Hmm. Hmm. Like Aragon. At times, these thoughts filled his consciousness to the point where he could barely rise in the morning, feeling bloated with their heaviness. Sounds like a depression. I mean, you can't blame the kid. He's a man. Turning on the road. He, oh, he becomes a man. <laughs> I don't. Turning on the road, he headed north through Palancar Valley, back to Carvajal. The notched mountains on either side were laden with snow, despite the spring greenery that had crept over the valley floor in the past weeks. Overhead, a single gray cloud drifted toward the peaks. I don't even know what I just read. It sounds <laughs> beautiful. Spring is coming. Okay, a beautiful spring day. Roran, Roran ran a hand across his chin, feeling the stubble. Aragon caused all this him and his blasted curiosity by bringing that stone out of the spine. It had taken Roran weeks to reach that conclusion. He'd listened to everyone's accounts several times. He had Gertrude to the town healer read aloud the letter Brom had left him, and there was no other explanation. Whatever that stone was, it must have attracted the strangers. For that alone, he blamed Garrow's death on Aragon. That was weird. For that alone, he blamed Garrow's death on Aragon. Though not in anger, he knew that Aragon had intended no harm. No, what roused his fury was that Aragon had left Garrow unburied and fled Plancar Valley, abandoning his responsibilities to gallop off with the old storyteller on some harebrained journey. How could Aragon have so little regard for those left behind? Did he run because he felt guilty? Afraid? Did Brom mislead him with wild tales of adventure? And when, why, why would Aragon listen to such things at a time like that? I don't even know if he's dead or alive right now. Roran scowled and rolled his shoulders, trying to clear his mind. Brom's letter. Bah! He had never heard a more ridiculous collection of insinuations and ominous hints. The only thing it made clear was to avoid the strangers, which was common sense to begin with. The old man was crazy, he, he decided. So, I know he's, like, very obviously still in the grieving process, understandably. But it's like, can we take a second to maybe, like, see how Aragon felt in that situation? Because even in a scenario where there's no dragon, I personally would have felt, like, so guilty that Roran's gone and it was, like, sort of Aragon's responsibility to sort of take care of Garrow, I guess, in a way. Mm -hmm. And he died. And then he's so young. Like, it's so much easier to, like, run away from it and not have to look at it or deal with it than it is to deal with it. Like, that's such an adult thing to me is to, like, stay and just deal with it. I think, like, Gar Roran's whole thing, though, is, like, he should have... He should have put aside whatever he wanted and at least buried Garrow and then gone off if he needed to. <clears throat> a flicker of movement caused Roran to turn, and he saw twelve deer, including a young buck with velvet horns, trotting back into the trees. He made sure to note their location so he could find them tomorrow. He was proud that he could hunt well enough to support himself in Horse House, though he had never been as skilled as Aragon. I think I just had a deja vu. Of you reading about the deer. Really? That was bizarre. Whoa. As he walked, he continued to order his thoughts. After Garrow's death, Roran had abandoned his job at Dempton's Mill in Theronsford and returned to Carvajal. Horst ag had agreed to house him and, in the following months, had provided him wor with work in the forge.
oh no, is this going to be like, um, so is Roran going to like become hardened and then he's just going to become a blacksmith, which will represent like how he feels inside, like a hardened man. Is it like a metaphor? Is that the word I'm looking for? Metaphor yeah. for how he feels inside. I don't know. I always skip this part. Oh, okay. No, but you'll be, you'll enjoy his story. Probably, I would say like the story of Roran is almost as enjoyable, if not more enjoyable, thank you, than Aragon's story. <clears throat> is this another book where I'm going to enjoy other people's characters more than the main character? You didn't enjoy Harry Potter? No, you didn't. You like Snape better. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Grief had delayed Roran's decisions about the future until two days ago when he finally settled upon a course of action. He wanted to marry Katrina, the butcher's daughter. The reason he went to Theris for it in the first place was to earn money to ensure a smooth beginning to their life together. But now, without a farm, a home, or means to support her, Roran could not in good conscience ask for Katrina's hand. His pride would not allow it, nor did Roran think Sloane, her father, would tolerate a suitor with such poor prospects. Even under the best of circumstances, Roran had expected to have a hard time convincing Sloane to give up Katrina. The two of them had never been friendly, and it was impossible for Roran to wed Katrina without her father's consent, not unless they wished to divide her family, anger the village by defying tradition, and most likely start a blood feud with Sloane. Considering the situation, it seemed to Roran that the only option available to him was to rebuild his farm, even if he had to raise the house and barn himself. It would be hard, starting from nothing, but... Once his position was secured, he could approach Sloane with his head held high. Next spring is as soon as we might talk, thought Roran, grimacing. He knew Katrina would wait, for a time at least. He continued at a steady pace until evening, when the village came into view. Within the small huddle of buildings, Wash hung on lines strung from the window to window. Men, file, or, yeah, men filed back toward the houses from surrounding fields thick with winter wheat. Behind Carvajal, Hall, the half-mile high, a Gualda Falls gleamed in the sunset as it tumbled down into the spine or tumbled down the spine into the Enora. The sight warmed Roran because it was so ordinary. Nothing was more comforting than having everything where it should be. Leaving the road, he made his way up to the rise where horse house sat with a view of the spine. The door was already open. Roran tromped inside, following the sounds of conversation into the kitchen. Horse was there, leaning on the rough table, pushed into one corner of the room, his arms bare to the elbow, Next to him was his wife, Elaine, who was nearly five months pregnant and smiling with quiet contentment. Their sons, Albrecht and Baldor, faced them. As Roran entered, Albrecht said, And I still hadn't left the forge yet. Thane swears he saw me, but I was on the other side of town. What's going on? said Roran, slipping off his pack. Elaine exchanged a glance with Horst. Here, let me get you something to eat. She set bread and a bowl of cold stew before him. Then he looked, or then she looked him in the eye, as if searching for a particular expression. How was it? Roran shrugged. All the wood is either burnt or rotting, nothing worth using. The well is still intact, and that's something to be grateful for, I suppose. I'll have to cut timber for the house as soon as possible if I'm going to have a roof over my head by planting season. Now tell me, what's happened? Ha! exclaimed Horst. There's been quite a row there has. Thane is missing a scythe, and he thinks Albrecht took it. He probably dropped it in the grass and forgot where he left it, snorted Albrecht. Probably, agreed Horst, smiling. Roran bit into into the bread. Roran bit into the bread. It doesn't make much sense accusing you. If you needed a scythe, you could just forge one. I know, says Albrecht, dropping into a chair. But instead of looking for his, he starts grousing that he saw someone leaving his field and that it looked a bit like me. And since no one else looks like me, I must have stolen the scythe. It was true that no one looked like him. Albrecht had inherited both his father's size and Elaine's honey blonde hair, which made him an oddity in Carvajal, where brown was the predominant hair color. In contrast, Baldor was both thinner and dark hair. Or, in contrast, Baldor was both thinner and dark haired. I'm sure it'll turn up, said Baldor quietly. Try not to get too angry over it in the meantime. Easy for you to say. As Roran finished the last of the bread and started on the stew, he asked Horst, Do you need me for anything tomorrow? Not especially. I'll just be working on Quimby's wagon. The blasted frame still won't sit square. Roar nodded, pleased. Good. Then I'll take the day and go hunting. There are a few deer farther down the valley that don't look too scrawny. The ribs weren't showing, at least. Baldur suddenly brightened. Do you want some company? Sure. We can leave at dawn. 
What? Okay, so wait. Those two people are Horst's sons? Okay. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't, like, miss... <coughs> Hearing that, and then how old are they supposed to be? I don't know. Do they have Gon's age, I think. Okay, because I was like, why does this kid have a scythe? Does he like have a farm? But I don't know. <clears throat> when he finished eating, Roran scrubbed his face and hands clean, then wandered outside to clear his head. Stretching leisurely, he strolled toward the center of town. Halfway there, the chatter of excited voices outside the Seven Sheaves caught his attention. He turned, curious, and made his way to the tavern, where an odd sight met him. Sitting on the porch was a middle-aged man draped in a patchwork leather coat. Beside him was a pack festooned with the steel jaws of, tra- of the trapper's trade. Several dozen villagers listened as he gestured expansively and said, So, when I arrived in Theron's Ford, I went to this man, Neil, good honest man. I help in his fields during the spring and summer. Roar nodded. Trappers spent the winter squirreled away in the mountains, returning in the spring to sell their skins to tanners like Gedrick, and then to take up work, usually as farmhands. Since Carvajal was the northernmost village in the spine, many trappers passed through it, which was one of the reasons Carvajal had its own tavern, blacksmith, and tanner. That's a good bit of information. Hmm. <clears throat> After a few steins of ale to lubricate my speaking, you understand. After a... a, a Aff. <laughs> what? After a few steins of ale to lubricate my speaking. You understand. And huh. then you were like, like stumbling, oh, stumbling. over your words. And then I like, get it. it's just funny. After a half year with nary a word uttered, except perhaps for blaspheming the world and all beyond when losing a bear biter, I come to kneel, the froth still fresh on my beard, and start exchanging gossip. As our transaction proceeds, I ask him all gregarious, like, that's a big word for a trapper to be using. Yeah, can we chill out? The news of the empire or the king. May he rot with gangrene and trench mouth. Was anyone born or died or banished that I should know of? And then guess what? Neil leaned forward, (laughs) going all serious about the mouth, and said that word is going around. There is from Drasleona and Gilead of strange happenings here. There and everywhere in Allegasia, the Urgles have fair disappeared from civilized lands and good riddance, but not one man can tell why or where. Af, the trade in the Empire, has dried up as a result of raids and attacks, and from what I heard, it isn't the work of mere brigands, for the attacks are too widespread, too calculated. No goods are stolen, only burned or soiled, but that's not the end of it. Oh no, not by the tip of your blessed grandmother's whiskers. <laughs> that's so silly and fun trapper shook his head and took a sip from his wineskin before continuing there be mutters of a shade haunting the northern territories not anymore he's been seen along the edge of due weldon varden and near gilead they say his teeth are filed to points his eyes are as red as wine and his hair is as red as the blood he drinks worse something seems to have gotten our fine mad monarch's dander up so it has Five days past, a juggler from the south stopped at Theronsford on his lonesome way to Cunon, and he said the troops have been mo- moving and gathering, though for what was beyond him. Cunon is a city. I assume so. He shrugged, as my pap taught me when I was suckling when I was a suckling babe. <laughs> where there's smoke, there's fire. Perhaps it's the Varden. They've caused old iron bones enough pain in the arse over the years, or perhaps Galbatorix finally decided he's had enough of tolerating Serta. At least he knows where to find it, unlike those rebels. He'll crush Serta like a bear crushes an ant, he will. Ron blinked as a babble of questions exploded around the trapper. He was inclined to doubt the report of a shade. It sounded too much like a story a drunk woodsman might invent, but the rest of it all sounded bad enough to be true. Serta. Little information reached Carvajal about that distant country, but Ron at least knew that although Serta and the Empire were obstin- ostensibly at peace, Serdans lived in constant fear that their more powerful neighbor to the north would invade them. For that reason, it was said that Orin, their king, supported the Varden. If the trapper was right about Galbatorix, then it could mean ugly war crouched in the future, accompanied by the hardships of increased taxes and forced conscription. I would rather live in an age devoid of momentous events. Upheaval makes already difficult lives such as ours nigh impossible. What's more, there have been tales of, 
Here, the trapper paused and with a knowing expression, tapped the side of his nose with his forefinger. Tales of a new rider in Allegasia. He laughed then, a big hearty laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just thinking, so when he's talking about how like he's like sick of shit going on, right? He just wants it to be like chill. I recently rewatched that Locusism video and I was like thinking, you don't want that. You don't want boring old, same old nothing. You know? Your Me? heart No, Roran. Roran. Your heart yearns for chaos. It does. It truly does. Disorder, struggle. I think really like your heart struggles or your heart yearns for strug. It wants that strug, you know? Yeah, nobody likes it when it's easy. If you guys haven't seen that video, it's really, really good. Be sure to check it out. All you have to do is type in Locusism and it should be like the first video. God, that fucking, that video. It's a great video. A uh, big hearty laugh, slapping his belly as he rocked back on the porch. <laughs> it's like me. <laughs> Roran laughed as well. He shouldn't. I mean, in the he doesn't know, but you know. Stories of riders appear every few years. They had excited his interest the first two or three times, but he soon learned not to trust such accounts, for they all came to naught. The rumors were nothing more than wishful thinking on the part of those part. The rumors were nothing more than wishful thinking on the part of those who longed for a brighter future. He was about to head off when he noticed Katrina standing by the corner of the tavern, garbed in a long russet dress decorated with green ribbon. She gazed at him with the same intensity with which he gazed at her. Going over, he touched her on the shoulder, and together they slipped away. What? He touched her on the shoulder. That's what it says. I know, but I was just thinking, like... I guess it makes sense, but it just seemed so... What if I did that, and then we slipped? <laughs> <laughs> just slipped away. Something slid away. They walked over to the edge of Carvajal, where they stood looking at the stars. The heavens were brilliant, shimmering with thousands of celestial fires, and arching above them from north to south was a glorious pearly band that streamed from horizon to horizon, like diamond dust tossed from a pitcher. Without looking at him, Katrina rested her head on Roran's shoulder and asked, How was your day? I returned home. He felt her <laughs> stiffen against him. Oh my god, is he gonna freak out again? What? So she's like, yeah, was so was it like how was your day? And he just said, I came home. <laughs> was that the Well like his farm. Okay. What was it like? Terrible. His voice caught and he fell silent, holding her tightly. The scent of her copper hair on his cheek was like an elixir of wine and spice and perfume. Oh, she's a redhead? Did I know that? No, I think so. It seeped deep inside him, warm and comforting. The house, the barn, the fields are all being overrun. I wouldn't have found them if I didn't know where to look. She finally turned to face him, stars flashing in her eyes, sorrow on her face. Oh, Roran, she kissed him, lips brushing his for a brief moment. You have endured so much loss, and yet your strength has never failed you. Will you return to your farm now? Aye, farming is all I know. And what shall become of me? He hesitated. From the moment he began to court her, an unspoken assumption that they would marry had existed between them. There had been no need to discuss his intentions. They were as plain as the day was long, and so her question unsettled him. It also felt improper to address the issue in such an open manner when he was not ready to, te to tender an offer. It was his place to make the overtures, first to Sloane, then to Katrina, not hers. Still, he had to deal with her concern now that it had been expressed. Katrina, I could not approach your father as I had planned. He would laugh at me, and rightly so. We have to wait. Once I have a place for us to live, and I've collected my first harvest, then he will listen to me. She faced the sky once more and whispered something so faint he could not make it out. What? I said, are you afraid of him? Of course not. I... Then you must get his permission tomorrow and set the engagement. Make him understand that though you have nothing now, you will give me a good home and be a son-in-law he can be proud of. There's no reason we should waste our years living apart when we can feel like... or when we feel like this. I can't do that, he said with a note of despair, willing her to understand. I can't provide for you. I can't. Don't you understand? She stepped away, her voice strained with urgency. I love you, Roran, and I want to be with you, but Father has other plans for me. There are more, far more eligible men than you, and the longer you delay, the more he presses me to consent to a match of which he approves. He fears I will become an old maid, and I fear that too. I have only so much time, our, or 
I have only so much time or choice in Carvajal. If I must take another, I will. Tears glistened in her eyes as she gave him a searching glance, waiting for his response, then gathered up her dress and rushed back to the houses. Roran stood there, motionless, motionless with shock. Her absence was as acute for him as losing the farm. The world suddenly gone cold and unfriendly. It was a part... It was as if a part of him had been torn away. It was hours before he could return to horse and slip into bed. So, if I'm not mistaken, I think, like, during the medieval time, like, a woman became an old maid at, like, 25. I think. It's, like, quite young. Well, yeah, because they only lived to, like, fucking 30. Mm. Like, 40. Yeah, like, 45. 40, 50. Which, like, makes sense, because that would be, like, if you were unmarried at 40, I guess. But st- I don't, I guess, like, it's a different time now. Like, now it, like, doesn't matter, but it's just wild. The wild time to be alive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 5. The Hunted Hunters. Dirt crunched under Roran's boots as he led the way down the valley, which was cool and pale in the early hours of the overcast morning. Baldor followed close behind, both of them carrying strung bows. <coughs> Neither spoke as they studied their surroundings for signs of deer. There. 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 There, said Baldor in a low voice, pointing at a set of tracks leading toward a bramble on the edge of the Honora. I would say that that's a low voice. There. There. Rora nodded and started after the spore. What does that mean? What? S-P-O-O-R? Spore? I don't know. Spore? I feel like that's a hunting term. That you were like a huntress or something. Okay. I've never heard that word. My dad's never used that word. Call your dad. Dad, what's a spore? (laughs) He'd be like, oh, I'll tell you about spore. (laughs) (laughs) It looked about a day old, so he risked speaking. Could I have your advice, Baldur? You seem to have good understanding of people. Of course. What is it? For a long time, the pat of their feet was the only noise. Sloane wants to marry off Katrina, and not to me. Every day that passes increases the chance he will arrange a union to his liking. What does Katrina say of this? Roran shrugged. Shrugged? Roran shrugged. He is her father. She cannot continue to defy his will when no one she does want has stepped forward to claim her. That is you. I. And that's why you were up so early. It was no question. In fact, Roran had been too worried to sleep at all. He had spent the entire night thinking about Katrina, trying to find a solution to their predicament. I can't bear to lose her, but I don't think Sloane will give, a, go, give us his blessing. <clears throat> what with my position and all. No, I don't think he would, agreed Baldor. He glanced at Roran out of the corner of his eyes. What is it you want my advice on, though? A snort of laughter escaped Roran. How can I convince Sloane otherwise? How can I resolve this dilemma without starting a blood feud? He threw his hands up. What should I do? Have you no ideas? I do, but not of a sort I find pleasing. It occurred to me that Katrina could simply announce we were engaged, not that we are yet, and hang the consequences. That would force Sloane to accept our betrothal. A frown creased Baldur's brow. He said carefully, Maybe, but it would also create a slew of bad feelings throughout Carvajal. Few would approve of your actions, nor would it be wise to force Katrina to choose between you or her family. She might resent you for it in years to come. I know, but what alternative do I have? Before you take such a drastic step, I I recommend you try to win Sloane over as an ally. There's a chance you might succeed, after all. If If it's made clear to him that no one else will want to marry an angry Katrina, especially when you're around a cuckold, the husband... (laughs) What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what did that say? That's what it said. No, we read it. There's a chance you might succeed after all. If it's made clear to him that no one else will want to marry an angry Katrina, especially when you're around to cuckold the husband. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Fucking cuck. <laughs> Shit. Fucking way to go, Baldor. Roran grimaced and kept his gaze on the ground. Baldor laughed. Same. <laughs> Same. What? I've... 
not read this enough. <laughs> I do not remember that being a... Oh, hold on. I probably just didn't understand it. I want to look up what cuckold technically means because I'm not... I don't think I'm understanding that. Oh, a man whose wife is unfaithful. Adultery. Cuckoldry. That's what it means. Okay. Damn. I, just, I thought it meant, like, her husband. I thought it was... More of like a newer definition of the word cuckold. And so I thought that was comical. <clears throat> and then Balder just laughs. If you fail, well then, you can proceed with confidence knowing that you have indeed exhausted all of the routes. Roots. Route? Roots? Because routes, the pronunciation on it is different technically in English, right? Um, where I'm from, we say route. Yeah, but you would say en route. En all route? The, yeah, but it's like all of the routes. I would say routes. <clears throat> okay. If you fail, well, then you can proceed with confidence knowing that you have indeed exhausted all of their routes. And people will be less likely to spit upon you for breaking tradition and more likely to say Sloane's bullheaded ways brought it upon himself. Neither course is easy. You knew that to begin with, Baldur grew somber again. No doubt there will be harsh words if you challenge Sloan, but things will settle down in the end. Perhaps not comfortably, but at least bearably. Aside from Sloan, the only people you're, you'll really offend are prouds like Quimby, though. How Quimby can brew such a hail drink yet be so starched and bitter himself is beyond me. Rora nodded, understanding. Grudges could simmer for years in Carvajal. I'm glad we could talk. It's been... He faltered, thinking of all the discussions he and Aragon used to share. They had, they had been, as Aragon once said, brothers in all but blood. It had been deeply comforting to know that someone existed who would listen to him, no matter the time or circumstances, and to know that person would always help him, no matter the cost. The absence of such a bond left Roar and feeling empty. Baldar did not press him to finish his sentence, but instead stopped to drink from his water skin. Roran continued for a few yards, then halted as a scent intruded on his thoughts. It was the heavy odor of seared meat and charred pine boughs. Who would be here besides us? Breathing deeply, he turned in a circle, trying to determine the source of the fire. A slight gust brushed past him from farther th down the road, carrying a hot, smoky wave. The aroma of food was intense, enough to make his mouth water. He beckoned to Baldor, who hurried to his side. Smell that? Baldur nodded. Together they returned to the road and followed it south. About a hundred feet away, it bent around a copse of cottonwoods and curved out of view. As they approached the turn, the rise and fall of voices reached them, muffled by the thick layer of morning fog over the valley. At the copse fringe, Roran slowed to a stop. It was foolish to surprise people when they too might be out hunting. Still, something bothered him. Perhaps it was a number of voices. The group seemed bigger than any family in the valley. Without thinking, he stepped off the road and slipped behind the underbrush lining the copse. "'What are you doing?' whispered Baldor. Roran put a finger to his lips and crept along parallel to the road, keeping his footsteps as quiet as possible. As they rounded the bend, he froze. On the grass by the road was a camp of soldiers. Thirty helmets gleamed in a shaft of morning light as their owners devoured fowl and stew cooked over several fires." The men were mud-splattered and travel-stained, but Galbatorix's symbol was still visible on their red tunics, a twisting flame outlined in gold thread. Underneath Fire Nation? <laughs> <laughs> That's it? They're just the Fire Nation? Hell yeah. Dragon, human, elf, dwarf. Long ago, the four nations <laughs> lived harmoniously until the Fire Nation attacked Shit. You right. They're all representative of an uh, element. They are. I was just like realizing that. Like, damn. Underneath their tunics, they wore leather brigandines. Heavy with riveted squares of steel, mail shirts, and then padded gambsons. Hmm. Gambsons. Most of the soldiers bore broadswords, though... Half a dozen were archers, and another half dozen carried wicked-looking halberds. And hunched in their midst were two twisted black forms that Roran recognized from the numerous descriptions the villagers provided upon his return from Theron's ford. The strangers who had destroyed his farm. His blood chilled. 
fuck. They're servants of the Empire. He began to step forward, fingers already reaching for an arrow, when Baldur grabbed his jerkin and dragged him to the ground. What the Don't. fuck was he going to do? Kill all, like, 30 of them? Yeah. No. At least shoot an arrow into the Razak. Don't. You'll get us both killed. Rurn glared at him, then snarled. That's... They're the bastards. He stopped, noticing that his hands were shaking. They've returned. Rorin, whispered Baldur intently. You can't do anything. Look, they work for the king. Even if you managed to escape, you'd be an outlaw everywhere, and you'd bring disaster on Carvajal. What do they want? What can they, what can they want? The king. Why did Galbatorix countenance my father's torture? If they, don't, if they didn't get what they needed from Garrow, and Aragorn flooded with Brom, they must want you. Baldor paused, letting the words sink in. We have to get back and warn everyone. Then you have to hide. The strangers are the only ones with horses. We can get first if we run. Or we can get there first if we run. Roran stared through the bush. Boosh. <laughs> Roran stared at the brush from the obliv... Or Roran stared through the bush. Holy fuck. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thanks. Roran stared through the brush at the oblivious soldiers. His heart pounded fiercely for revenge, clamoring to attack and fight to set those two agents of misfortune pierced what the fuck? To see those two agents of misfortune pierced with arrows and brought to their own justice. It mattered not that he would die as long as he could wash clean his pain and sorrow in one fell moment. All he had to do was break over, break cover. All he had to do was break cover. The rest would take care of itself. Just one small step for Roran. One big step for the plot. <laughs> With a choked sob, he clenched his fist and dropped his head. I can't leave Katrina. He remained rigid, eyes squeezed shut, then with agonizing slowness dragged himself back. Home then. Without waiting for Baldor's reaction, Roran slipped through the trees as fast as he dared. Once the camp was out of sight, he broke out onto the road and ran down the dirt track, channeling his frustration, anger, and even fear into speed. Baldor scrambled behind him, gaining on the open stretches. Roran slowed to a comfortable trot and waited for him to draw level before saying, You spread the word, I'll talk with Horst. Baldur nodded and they pushed on. After two miles, they stopped to drink and rest briefly. When their panting subsided, they continued through the low hills preceding Carvajal. The rolling ground slowed them considerably, but even so, the village soon burst into view. So like, they say like after two miles, I understand they're probably like running quick, or they're like mm -hmm. actually running and not just like jogging. Yeah. But like, Two miles isn't that far to run. Well, it is when you're not in shape, you know? Like, if you don't have good cardio, you really like to eat hot Cheetos a lot. <laughs> you like beer. <laughs> you like beer. Two miles might be a little far to run. Rowan immediately broke... Oh. Yeah, Roran immediately broke for the forge, leaving Baldar to make his way to the center of town. As he pounded past the houses, Roran wildly considered schemes to evade or kill the strangers without incurring the wrath of the Empire. He burst into the forge to catch Horst, ta tapping a peg into the side of Quimby's wagon, singing, Hey, yo, and a ring and a ding and a ring <laughs> from old iron, wily old iron, with the beat and a bang on the bones of the land I conquered, wily old iron. I love that. It's fun. Horse stopped his mallet in mid-blow when he saw Roran. What's the matter, lad? Is Baldor hurt? Roran shook his head and leaned over, grasping for air. In short bursts, he reiterated all they had seen and its possible implications. Most importantly, that it was now clear the strangers were agents of the Empire. Horse fingered his beard. Ooh, yeah, baby. You have to leave Carvajal. Fetch some food from the house, then take my mare. Ivor's pulling stumps with her and ride into the foothills. Once we know what the soldiers want, I'll send Albrecht or Baldor, Baldor with word. What will you say if they ask for me? Bet you're out hunting and we don't know when you'll return. It's true enough, and I doubt they'll chance blundering around in the trees for fear of missing you. Assuming it's you they're really here, they're really after. Rora nodded, then turned and ran, and ran to Horse House. Inside, he grabbed the mare's tack and bags from the wall quickly tied turnips, beets, jerky, and a loaf of bread in a knot of blankets, snatched up a tin pot, and dashed out, pausing only long enough to explain the situation to Elaine. The supplies were an awkward bundle in his arms as he jogged from east or 
as he jogged east from Carvajal to Ivor's farm. Ivor himself stood behind the farmhouse, flicking the mare with a willow wand as she strained to tear the hairy roots of an elm tree from the ground. Come on now, shouted the farmer. Put her back into it. <laughs> the horse shuddered with effort, her bit lathered, then with a final surge tilted the stump on its side so the roots reached toward the sky like a cluster of gnarled fingers. Ivor stopped her exertion with a twitch of the reins and parted her good naturally. All right, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Roran hailed him from a distance, and when they were close, pointed to the horse. I need to borrow her. He gave his reasons. Ivor swore and began unhitching the mare, grumbling. Always the moment I get a bit of work done. That's when the interruption comes. Never before. What? I mean, that I feel like that like train of logic reminds me of like when you're looking for something, and it's always in the last place you look. I don't know. Never mind. He crossed his arms and frowned at Roran, or as Roran cinched the saddle, intent on his work. When he was ready, Roran swung onto the horse, bow in hand. I'm sorry for the trouble, but it can't be helped. Well, don't worry about it. Just make sure you aren't caught. I'll do that. As he set his heels on the mare's side, Roran heard Ivor called, And don't be hiding up my creek! <laughs> Roran grinned and shook his head, bending low over the horse's neck. He soon reached the footholes of foothalls wow he soon reached the foothills of the spine and worked his way up to the mountains that formed the north end of Palancar valley from there he climbed to a point on the mountainside where he could observe carvajal without being seen then he picketed his steed and settled down to wait roran shivered eyeing the dark dark pines he disliked being this close to the spine hardly anyone from carvajal dared set foot in the mountain range and those who did often failed to return before long except aragon yeah before long, Roran saw the soldiers march up the road in a double line, two ominous, flak, two ominous black figures at their head. They were stopped at the edge of Carvajal by a ragged group of men, some of them with picks in hand. <coughs> the two sides spoke, then simply faced each other, like growling dogs waiting to see who would strike first. After a long moment, the men of Carvajal moved aside and let the intruders pass. What happens now, wondered Roran, rocking back on his heels. By evenings, the soldiers had set up camp in a field adjacent to the village. Their tents formed a low gray block that flickered with weird shadows as sentries patrolled the perimeter. In the center of the block, a large fire sent billows of smoke into the air. Roran had made his own camp, and now he simply watched and thought. He always assumed that when the strangers destroyed his home, they got what they wanted, which was a stone Aragon brought from the spine. They must not have found it, he decided. Perhaps Aragon managed to escape with the stone. Perhaps he felt that he had to leave in order to protect it. He frowned. That would go a long way toward explaining why Aragon fled, but it still seemed far-fetched to Roran. Whatever the reason, that stone must be a fantastic treasure for the king to send so many men to retrieve it. I can understand what would make it so valuable, or I can't understand what would make it so valuable. Maybe it's magic. Maybe. Maybe. He breathed deeply. He breathed deeply of the cool air, listening to the hoot of an owl. A flicker of movement. You like my little... It just... <laughs> anytime we talk about owls, I always have like a flashback to when we lived in Denver and we were like hooing at that owl and it was like <laughs> going to kill us. Good times. Also, when is this happening? So I know he was like, oh, five months ago, Aragon left. But like in relation to Aragon, like where is Aragon right now during when this is happening? Five months after Aragon left. <laughs> right is he with the Varden <clears throat> I think it's I think it's at the same time is Varden yeah I think it's the same time okay I think so like, it's like meanwhile I think the, when the sun rises it's the same sun that's rising you know at the same time the same day we're not like going back into the past like how I originally thought we were. Okay. I think we're just the same time. So yesterday the Urgles attacked the Varden. That's what you're telling me. Well, it had been a couple days, right? Mm -hmm. Since that happened. Like when we're going back and forth between Aragon and Roar and it's like the same the same time. 
they're happening at the same time. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because he said, right? He did say, like, Aragon left five months ago. Right. Yes, he <clears throat> did say that. It only took Aragon five months to go from Carvajal Hall all the way to the Barden. Yeah, to go. Whoop. Okay. A flicker of movement caught his attention. Glancing down the mountain, he saw a man approaching in the forest below. Roran ducked behind a boulder, bow drawn. He waited until he was sure it was Albrecht, then whistled softly. <laughs> Albrecht soon arrived at the boulder. On his back was over full. On his back was an over full pack, which he dropped to the ground with a grunt. <clears throat> I thought I'd never find you. I'm surprised you did. Can't say I enjoyed wandering through the forest after sundown. I kept expecting to walk into a bear, or worse. The spine isn't a fit place for men, if you ask me. Roran looked back to Roran looked back out at Carvajal. So why are they here? To take you into custody. They're willing to wait as long as they have or they're willing to wait as long as they have to for you to return from hunting. Roran sat with a hard thump, his gut clenched with cold anticipation. Did they give a reason? Did they mention the stone? Albrecht shook his head. All they would say is it's the king's business. The whole day we've been asked or the whole day they've been asking questions about you and Aragon. It's all they're interested in. He hesitated. I'd stay, but they'll notice if I'm missing tomorrow. I brought plenty of food and blankets, plus some of Gertrude's salves in case you injure yourself. You should be fine up here. Summoning his energy, Roran smiled. Thanks for the help. Anyone would do it, said Albrecht, with an embarrassed shrug. He started to leave then tossed over his shoulder. By the way, the two strangers, they're called the Razak. If that wasn't obvious enough. I mean, I guess it's obvious to us. Fuck. Fuck. I felt like that was supposed to be some sort of a reveal. <laughs> you think? Like, to be honest, oh, by the way, they're the Razak. Dun, dun, dun. Like, that's kind of what it felt like to me, but... So I'm assuming that the timeline is just the same. It's just... Like it's the not, same, right? It's it's like the same forward. day. Yeah, it's like the same day for both of them. Okay. Because I originally thought that they go back in time to when Aragon left, mm -hmm. but that's not the case. Obviously, it's at least right. been five months since Aragon left. So wherever Aragon is on his like adventure. Okay, I guess it would make sense that he wouldn't go back and forth on the timeline, and he would just keep continuing forward. Okay. I just wanted to make sure so that, like, as far as the Razak are concerned, I know, like, where we're at in their story. Because they're, like, really the only thing linking Aragon and Roran at this point. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, so you want to make sure that, like, that we don't, what? Nothing. I just wanted to know. Like, they, because th I guess I'm just wondering at this point, like, did the Razak, like, already capture Aragon and then... Murtag came and saved them? Yes. Okay. Definitely that happened within five months. I Is think they made it all the way to... I think Aragon made it all the way to the Varden within five months. Okay. Wait. So, the the Razak also caught Saphira, right? Mm-hmm. So, they know Aragon has the dragon. Why the fuck are they questioning Roran? <clears throat> they're not. Oh. They're d bringing him into custody. Okay. Because they're going to... Kill him. No, <laughs> no, they're going to hold him like we have your brother. Oh, I guess cousin. But oh, yeah. right. OK. I get it now. Join Galbatorix or we'll fucking slit his throat. Give yourself up. I get it. Yeah. Hmm. I feel like I got, I don't know. I feel like I got like almost enough information for something, but like not quite. On what? Anything. <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> You're literally saying nothing right now. What are you saying to me? <laughs> I mean, like to like, s to see where it's going, maybe like a theory of something like, oh. Like, I didn't quite get enough, like, information. It was like, I did get a lot of good information, 
to like into Roran. Also, the writing was so good in comparison. It's just getting better. His writing starting off this book has just been phenomenal now. <clears throat> and then um, I don't like it was it was still like really good, but I don't really like the all like the conversation between Katrina and them and stuff like it's it seems like a little weird. But it's only I remember it, it's only weird at first and then it gets so much better. Um, it's like he didn't really like he like knew how he wanted Roar and Katri- in Katrina to be to get like right. how he wanted that to be. But then he was he kind of was like, I don't know how I'm going to start these guys out together. Um, I noticed that he's giving people personality through their dialogue. That he started doing that yep. really into it. Um, I think he's experienced not experimenting, maybe experimenting with dialogue. So I think we're not past the point where things feel scripted yet. Like it doesn't feel like a natural conversation necessarily yet. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a, I'm telling you to say this, like kind of scripted. Yeah. But that's okay. I'm really into the story. Also, why is he so weird about Katrina? She sounds like she would just be like, deuces for Aragon. Wait, what? Not Aragon. <laughs> no, not Aragon. <laughs> um, other one, Rory. Like, I love your cousin. <laughs> She's like, you should marry me before I marry your cousin. <laughs> <laughs> that ooh, wow, what a day. Um, I, I guess like I get it that it's sort of like he has like a responsibility as like Amanda. I thought you just said Amanda. <laughs> His responsibility as Amanda. No, his name's Roaring Demi. (laughs) I'm going to cry. Oh, my God. Better writing. Ready to hear more. Unfortunately, that's all we get to hear for Roaring now. Now we're back to Aragon. This was so much more. You know what I'm saying? You feel me? Like, (laughs) I don't know how else to explain it. Anybody else feeling... Leave us in the comment section <laughs> if you're feeling. <laughs> Is that how you did it? Well, everyone, thank you so much for watching. If you guys liked the episode, you know what to do. Hit that thumbs up. Um, for all of you guys, all of you new Patreons, pa- patrons. I just butchered it on purpose. Patrons. For all you patrons, you guys should have access to the recording room now. So... Bada bing, bada boom. See you in the next recording. (laughs) See you guys in the next one. You got a boyfriend. I bet he doesn't kiss you. That's not funny. That's real. Don't sing that song. No, that's not funny. I know I get it. With the recent thing that happened. No, I get it. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm trying to be. Well, you look angry. I'm. (laughs)